आप सबको बहुत स्वागत और यह देख के हौसला बहुत बढ़ता है कि यह हॉल और इस हॉल के बाहर और उसके भी बाहर बहुत सारे नौजवान हैं तो कौन कहता है कि इंसाफ और बराबरी और सच्चाई और मोहब्बत की लड़ाई में नौजवानों को दिलचस्पी नहीं है और कौन कहता है कि प्रोफेसर अमृत सेन के ख्याल पुराने पड़ गए हैं आप सबका बहुत स्वागत जब हमने प्रोफेसर अमृत सेन से नीलाभ मिश्रा पब्लिक डायलॉग सीरीज की शुरुआत करने का कि गुजारिश की तो प्रोफेसर सेन ने मुझसे ये कहा कि आई मैं संस्कृत जानता हूँ बांग्ला तो मैं जानता ही हूँ और मैं लैटिन जानता हूँ और बाकी भाषाएं भी लेकिन हिंदी के साथ कुछ मैं उसे हैंडल नहीं कर पाता हूँ तो हमने कहा हिंदी भी बाकी हिंदुस्तानी ज़ुबानों में से एक है और उसे भी जगह मिलनी चाहिए तो सिर्फ इसलिए कि मैं मदद कर सकूँ बहुत सारे लोगों की सिर्फ तर्जुमे में नहीं बल्कि जो बातचीत होगी उसमें भी मैं सिद्धार्थ वरदराजन से अनुरोध करता हूं कि वे बातचीत शुरू करें थैंक यू वेरी मच अपूर्वानंद थैंक यू फॉर फॉर दैट इंट्रोडक्शन एंड थैंक यू ऑडियंस फॉर बीइंग हियर दिस इज रियली वेरी इंस्पायरिंग टू हैव दिस हॉल नॉट ओनली फुल बट विद 99% of the faces that I've seen for the first time in in Delhi in Delhi it's it's normal to have have the usual suspects at at events like this so it's really refreshing to have uh, uh, new faces young faces uh, you know I believe that people have come from different campuses and I think this is marvelous because uh, today what I hope uh, we will do is to uh, engage uh, professor sen in a discussion on you know really a set of issues that uh, are so central to uh, what is happening in india and the world today and which uh, touch our lives and touch the polity uh, in in uh, all sorts of ways and i'm sure that there will be uh, plenty of food for thought that you will hopefully take away uh, and um, carry on engaging with when you are back uh, in your uh, respective campuses uh, the way that we will conduct this is that uh, i will uh, have uh, dialogue uh, with professor sen for around 45 50 minutes and um, uh, then uh, open the floor for questions from the audience um, and at that point we would request you to be brief and to be pointed so that we can fit as many uh, questions as possible so without any further ado let me launch in uh, this is an unscripted uh unscripted dialogue uh <coughs> un unlike unlike certain other personalities who al always want questions in advance and 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 they don't allow uh, they don't allow follow up questions uh we we will have plenty of that over here hopefully um and uh, let me let me plunge straight in because the uh, you know the broad themes of today are um populism neo nationalism citizenship and it seems to me that we can take the discussion in multiple directions but i want to start with uh the topic that's top of everybody's mind today uh which is nationalism danger of war uh you know we've been through um you know since since cargill at least uh one has been through cycles of um you know highs and lows on the india pakistan front um perhaps if you take a longer view ups and downs there have been periods of engagement periods of war uh but never have uh, have i seen in my, at least my time as a journalist the last 20 years uh such a barren fallow dangerous period as we have right now uh where it seems as if the possibility of engagement uh, even of the very limited kind that we had 3 or 4 years ago seems completely impossible to imagine 
and uh, you actually have uh, open discussion on either side today of uh, the possibility of an India-Pakistan war. Uh, if that is not enough to alarm us, the manner in which discussion on war and nationalism is getting framed uh, in the public sphere, both in Pakistan and India, is, is, uh, is frightening. And I would say the role of the media is particularly alarming. But beyond the media, there is a sense in which the public sphere has gotten much more uh, more brittle, more uh, uh, intolerant, uh, more um, you know, uh, quick to pounce on people who are considered uh, deviants or who have views that are slightly away from uh, the official view. Uh, the Pakistan uh, uh, military spokesperson's press conference today, um, he answered various questions. And it, when it ended, the journalists present all broke into cheers of Pakistan Zindabad at the end of a press conference. And uh, things haven't reached quite that, uh, you know, we haven't seen that in press conferences here, but many of these anchors uh, on television behave in that manner. Uh, and Professor Sana, I want to uh, get your sense of this, um, you know, this is very new for us in the sense that, uh, uh, anchor, you know, people are saying that we need to not just deal with Pakistan and the threat of you know, outside enemy, but the, it's the enemy within that we have to deal with. And they use terms like parasite, dimak. Uh, is, is uh, you know, Apurva and I were chatting before you came, and uh, could this, is there a resonance with what the atmosphere was in the country in 62, when, um, uh, you know, again, there was a lot of anxiety, insecurity related to war, or are we today passing through uh, a period that is qualitatively new, different, and dangerous? Okay, is that better now? Okay. Only thing is I can't have tea anymore. But <laughs> <laughs> um, before answering the question, let me just say, 62, uh, I was still teaching in Cambridge. And I came back and joined the Delhi School of Economics in 63. And on the way, I stopped in Pakistan, mainly because of some friends of mine, very close friends who had gone there. Ari Fiftikar was one of them. Uh, Mabubul Haq was another. Uh, I was um, in, uh, in Lahore and, uh, and uh, Mabu in Karachi then. And uh, I spent about, oh, I don't know, two or three weeks. It, it was very difficult for me to sense there had been a war between the country to which I was going, namely India, and the country where I then was, namely Pakistan. So there is an element of um, lightness about it, which we ought to know. It isn't a problem similar to the hardened way, say, Israeli-Palestine situation has developed. There isn't that foundational uh, difficulty in it. Now, of course, how come the Palestinian-Israeli situation has become what it is? requires a different action, and if we have time, we can go to that. But there's a history to it, which is not um, similar to ours. This is very important to recognize. Uh, uh, the, I mean, they were making jokes. I remember Mabu uh, and some of the category of people were there. I mean, in the Karachi airport, that my plane was landing, and. Uh, there was anti-Indian statement to the effect that uh, one of them, Kali the Crown, who was still around in, in Washington, uh, told me as I landed, he said, oh, I didn't know you were coming only from Lahore. I thought you were coming from Delhi. And we were really scared. You're coming on an Indian, in an Indian airplane into, into an international fight. I was really scared about you. 
<laughs> it's only later when I got that you were only coming from Lahore in Pakistan International Airways. I was completely uh, happy about <laughs> the situation. So that's an anti-Indian statement. But it's not the kind that wars are made up of. And actually, even though the governments have done a lot to separate out the cricket teams and so on. The fact is that there's a course of things where the Indian point of view would have got nowhere but for support from the Pakistani team. So I think we have to recognize the nature of that. We have to recognize the history of it, that two bits of history that are overlooked often that when the country went into a partition, the riots that happened didn't actually happen in any scale before the 40s. And the country was split up in 46, 47. And by 51, at least one part of Pakistan, namely in Bangladesh, people were being killed not for uh, religious extremism, but for their extremism about language. Five people were killed what would have been five days earlier in February 21st uh, in a college in, in, in Dhaka. So that's just after partition and even in 19, in the election in 36, 37, I can't remember. Uh, Muslim League did not actually win any state at all. In fact, Bengal, which is a Muslim majority state, did not have a Muslim League win until 1946, the year before the partition. It was always secular parties, Congress, Peasants Party, and so on. And here I want to make a serious point and then move away, but I hope we can come back to it at some stage. The, the big thing which made, of course, Muslim League possible in, in Bengal was land. Most of the land was actually, much of the landlords were Hindus, whereas most of the peasants and the, and the underdogs were Muslim. And uh, it's certainly true that Sheikh Mujibur Rahman brought in a perspective that was much more profound than anything that happened earlier. But the fact is that somebody like Fazlul Haq, or a secular, uh, largely secular Bengali leader, would have had great difficulty to sell a story that Hindu-Muslim division didn't matter when it's correlate and reflection on land ownership was very great. And actually, everyone here, you said you want to see young faces, and you say what this old man is doing, he's recollecting the past. There's a reason for doing it. How come Bengal was full of Hindu landlords? How was it being governed? When Musidabad became the capital uh, of Bengal from Dhaka, Muslim Kuli Khan The entire kingdom moved and he was a Muslim king. The last king killed was Sayyid Dola. And when Clive decided to capture, he was lying to his street and telling everyone that he wants to have a friendly relationship with uh, Sayyid Dola and he was marching with his army to have a friendly relationship. And he made it, and he said that I've written a letter to Sirad saying, consult your friends, and you will see that they all agree with me that there's no point in our fighting. And then he mentioned nine names from Sirad's close friend, seven of whom are Hindus, and two Muslims. Now, there was no plan of having Muslim upper class in Bengal. In a way, 
It wasn't the plan, but that's the way history had unearthed in Lucknow and UP. It wasn't like that. So the history of the country is very divided. And it's one where the Hindu-Muslim division quite often did not have the kind of roots at all that a situation would demand. And as you know, and which is why people, when people ask the question, how come Bangladesh could become stable after having been East Pakistan? But the answer is the whole thing was a very ephemeral affair. In some ways, the distinction between Hindu Muslims in the, in the Western side was stronger, but never quite like what it is being built up to be now. You see, now we have reached a state where actually to like Pakistanis, Pakistani friend whose wedding you go to <laughs> when that occurs in an accessible space, would be regarded as a lack of patriotism of some kind. So what we are seeing is an implanting of a division. That's not a historical division, really. It's not just, uh, uh, it's not just Akbar. <laughs> uh, here's a trick question. What is the largest memorial built for the mother of the largest translator of Hindu scriptures into foreign languages? Huh? <laughs> well, the answer is Taj Mahal, because uh, the uh, Darashiko was the first translator of the Upanishad, single-handedly translated many, along with his funded friend, made all kinds of situation statements which upset his Muslim father in particular, but many others. And his mother was, of course, Mam Taj Mahal, after whom Taj Mahal is, is named. Now, the, it was regarded as a great eccentricity on the part of Darashiko. Real eccentricity that he was with studying Sanskrit and so on. It's not something that would make him look a kind of different from a human being. Arundel's son, who is also called Akbar, revolted against him, spent a lot of time with the Rajputs and then with the Marathas, and along with his Hindu servant, and was ultimately, Arundel managed to kill him. But when he is writing a letter, he was writing a letter to Arundel saying, uh, you describe the Hindus as being like that, but they are not like that. I've been living with them over the years. This is not Arundel's brother, it's his son we're talking about. Arundel himself had, and though he meant to be anti-Hindu, had about a third of his court people were Hindu. So I think we the first thing to recognize is that something is being planted in our mind about the division, which is not a historical division. And that's important to recognize because the historical division, as we know from the Palestinian situation, is very hard to elaborate. Now, there's a whole history of Jews across the world, including in Kerala uh, and so on. And, and being persecuted, not by, not by Muslims. In fact, uh, when uh, Maimonides was seeking a shelter, he found his shelter in, 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 the, in Cairo, in Saladin's 
capital. Uh, and so he was fleeing Spain, the Christian Spain, via Morocco, ultimately to Egypt, which is a Muslim kingdom. So I think there's a, you know, history is a subject which is taught, and I'm delighted that it is taught. But the question often arises, why do we study history? It's not just to learn from what happened, but also to see what divisions have been planted in our mind and why. Right now, the planting is very closely connected, in my judgment, with not only the war that's going on, but the kind of division that the elections no doubt will produce. So I think I would begin by saying that if we do not, in many ways, undermine the division that's part of the official thought, we are not doing justice to history. And that's the point that I want to make. Now, you might sound think that I made it in a very elaborate way. Uh, but uh, I, can, I can be more elaborate, but I won't carry out that threat if, if, even if, more. If, uh, uh, if, if I stick with this idea of, yeah. of, of a division being implanted, uh, it seems as if at the global level, uh, in India, it's become more respectable uh, to give vent to openly communal statements, uh, things that I would never have heard people say 10, 15, 20 years ago, certainly not people on television, not anchors. Uh, and similarly, in, in the United States, um, it's as if ra it's become more respectable to be racist. In Europe, anti-Semitism has a new lease of life. What explains the rise or the re-emergence of these kinds of uh, beliefs, sentiments, ideologies across the globe uh, at a time when, I mean, you know, you have rising literacy, you have greater flows of information, uh, rising standards of living, but despite that, uh, and across the board, Hungary, India, wherever you look, uh, it's these views, retrogressive views, divisive views, chauvinist views that seem to be um, on the up and up? I think that's an extraordinarily good question. I think Hungary, Poland, East Germany, and alas, unbelievably, parts of Italy, show something which is really quite new. That's not the way the world was even in the 1930s. There was a different division between Germany and, and others. But the interesting issue is that um, that's a phenomenon that's quite different from the phenomenon of Islamophobia that you see in America and to a great extent in, in much of Europe. And that's not a specific feature of Hungary and Poland. Though it takes very often the form it's bound to, like when there's Brexit propaganda, when they're showing pictures of immigrants coming in, they are talking really about European immigrants, but if you look at the pictures, they all look like Arabs, they all look like Syrians coming in. That's kind of combining tactics with uh, um, and in this case, pretty evil tactics with, uh, with a, a, a real situation. The, I think the Islam issue raises much bigger time that you and I, uh, you and I may have to get another time because it has moved a lot. If you lived in the world of 19th century and early 20th century, uh, and if you talk with an average European, there is no question that 
Islamic civilization is regarded as a far superior uh, situation than the, than the Hindu civilization. And you have the Arabian Nights, you have the people going, after, going to Cairo, you have the <laughs> mother in Orient Express, this being the uh, more uh, later, I think. Uh, that's, and in India, if, if you think, take James Mill, he was an equal opportunity vilifier, so he absolutely wrote nasty things about every, every known uh, white people. But when it came to Hindus and Muslims, there's no question that Muslims have some bare element of civilization which Hindus totally lack. And there are lots of things that you can easily pick up which would indicate that Hindus, because of their primitiveness and barbarity, would be capable of which the single god worshipping uh, non-heathen Muslims ne never would. Things have changed. The, uh, the world as I was waking up in the 30s, born in 1933, was uh, the Muslims were all losing power bit by bit. Uh, I happened to be quite lucky in being in a boat in a ship going to from Bombay to London through Suez Canal, just when Nasser came in and <laughs> grabbed the canal. And uh, then you suddenly heard a lot of anti-Muslim stories. And, and this is the only time I remember it very well when the ship stopped in Suez and everyone was asked to stand in a queue. They would not be let off the ground we were all in a queue going up the ship on the, on, the, on the steps, and I was on the seventh floor. And then a smartly dressed Egyptian officer in a white starch shirt came around and asked me where I was from. And I said I was from India. And then he immediately captured me, took me down, and said, you don't have to stand in the queue. You can go and see the town. And he put me in a bus. The reason I remember it is the only time since I'm an Indian citizen and used to standing in queues everywhere, it's the only time in my whole life, I'm 85 now, when I have been favorably treated for being an Indian. <laughs> this is the beginning of what you are looking at. And then, of course, the Islamophobia has, in its own process, gone. And so I have the reaction and the, the, the Islam the, sorry, Islam state and so on as emerged. So the the thing that the Indians and the uh, Indian guests have seen as a Hindu uh, uh, kingdom uh, is very connected uh, with that. I wouldn't say that that. I think there are lots of things where the internal politics is connected. That in itself is not. What is connected is that even though we tend to think of the uh, Hindu-Muslim being two nations, a Jinnah's two nation theory, the theory was first articulated from the Hindu side. I can't remember whether it was Diamond. Sabarka. Sabarka. It was Sabarka who, 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 who did that. So that, that certainly adds to that story. But right now, I think the advantage Indians get is something which is really generated elsewhere. And we are getting the result of it. It may not stay very long. And since I don't believe great discrimination on either side, I hope it doesn't stay. Right. The uh, problem of migrants or immigration, which is also cent central to a lot of the hardening of, of uh, attitudes that we see in Europe or even in, even in North America. Uh, it's a complex issue. I mean, in the sense that as, a, as an economist, one would argue, you could argue that um, societies would unambiguously benefit, aging societies 
would unambiguously benefit from being liberal as far as allowing migrants to come in. Uh, if you compare uh, countries which have a more liberal immigration policy, like Canada or Australia or, or the US, with those in Europe or Japan that don't, uh, you can see the great difference that uh, migration plays. And yet, there is no getting away from the sense of, I mean, the cultural insecurities that migration also generates. We see it in India, uh, in Assam, where, um, you know, we have this whole controversy over the National Register of Citizens and uh, the, the um, uh, of course, the BJP had assumed that the Assamese uh, who want Bengali migrants out would be seduced by the communalism of uh, the, the BJP and would, would say, fine, Hindu Bengalis are okay. Uh, but the Assamese are too smart for that, so they say, no, we don't, we don't want any, any Bengalis. But it was never a part of their thinking. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, um, but yet, uh, you know, when you, when you look at uh, the anxieties in Assam, um, I mean, one may be less sympathetic to somebody in Germany or somebody in Poland or Hungary who is resentful of, of migrants coming in. But um, when you see in Jharkhand, or Chhattisgarh outsiders, uh, in a way, taking over. So Adivasis are a minority. So how, do, how does one resolve in your mind the dilemma, the, the challenge and the opportunity that migration brings with the, uh, the, the need to preserve the, uh, certainly the cultural rights of, uh, of those whose land it originally is? I don't know that the challenge that uh, migration brings could be really compared with uh, the benefits that migration brings. Uh, sitting in India, we were talking about languages. We were talking about that. <laughs> By the way, before I forget, I ought to say, you know, Bihar had a role in that. Yes. Because when Sanskrit split into three parts, and the two that we're dealing with here, namely Sogaseni, based mainly in UP, and Magadhi, um, the, we're talking about the genesis of the Magadhi, and then the later form, namely Adha Magadhi, I may be a, one of the few persons in the world which at one stage could read Arta Magadhi. The Arta Magadhi's fit into languages generated, including Assamese, who did not think so well of how to deal with uh, <laughs> Hindu Bengalis as opposed to Muslim Bengalis. The Assamese, the Bengalis, and the Oriyas, these are with also other Magadhi. All of them lost their gender, gender around the 9th to 12th century. And the problem that I have with Hindi is getting the gender right. <laughs> it's absolutely impossible. <laughs> if you are raised in one, a language in, the, in which there is no gender, suddenly to invent gender, my God, that's difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> but coming back to your story, I mean, whatever may be the BGP official view now about the origin of Sanskrit, there is no question that it migrated into India. And, and then if you look at uh, Thailand to... <laughs> Into China, to Indonesia, to Korea, to parts of China, to Japan, and migrated that way. Uh, and its impact on language, literature, science, education, philosophy was absolutely extraordinary. So I, I think. I would put it, have difficulty in viewing 
problems of uh, migration with the same sense of uh, seriousness as the problems of, uh, as the benefits of, 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 uh, of migration. And that applies to science in America, even going back, science in Germany, uh, science in Britain. Uh, and it's also concerned with people having an interest elsewhere. When I was young, I had this notion since I was reading a lot of Shakespeare and a great interest in Italy, I told myself I'd love to have Shakespeare's diary about his visits to Italy. And, you know, I would like to know when is it he went to, to, to Venice, where Otello is landing, and who the two gentlemen and Verona, where they were in Verona talking to, when I, it became quite clear that I'd got it wrong. Shakespeare never went to Italy. <laughs> it's just that they were interested in each other. So along with migration, what we're looking at is interest in each other. And that ultimately is, I think, one of the greatest forces for good in the world. Not only it's because it spends philosophy and music and science and and counting and so on, but also because it has the potential for making friends out of people. Right. And you know, we sometimes forget the, the first printed book in, first printed book in, uh, um, in the world is a Chinese book printed in 868. It is a translation of what in English they call Diamond Sutra. The Sanskrit name for it, for it is Vajracetika Pradnaparamita. Now, and that was, it's an old Sanskrit book, but uh, it was translated first time for 401. Uh, A.D. by Kumar Jiva, who was half Turkish, half Indian. It was translated eight more times. In 868, it was translated into Chinese. And what did the dedication say? The dedication said, in memory of my parents and for universal free distribution in the world. The first printed book. So there was a, and of course that was, you know, the Koreans were doing the same, the Japanese were trying to do the same. I think the, I mean, if there's a big motive in my talk, and uh, including talking about Pakistan and Bangladesh and so on, it's just that knowing each other, a point that al made in 1115, sorry, 1015, in a book called Tariq, Tariq al-Hind, History of India, uh, that the reason why we have to study each other is because a natural tendency for us is to suspect each other. And that generates violence. And the reason why I'm, I'm writing this book, al was a mathematician, he uh, learned Sanskrit and he translated all the Sanskrit book. He translated uh, uh, in, in mathematical work too, including Brahmagupta's book and commented on Aryabha's book. But he was concerned that people in the Arab world, he wrote in Arabic, he was in, in fact in the Iranian, because the Iranians and the Arabic world, and the whole Arab world spreading all the way to Cordova in Spain, could then read something about India. By the way, I can't resist saying that while he says many interesting things about India, the, his remark that I like most is to say that here I've been in this country for 10 years. I admire their mathematics, I admire their philosophy, but nothing can I admire as much as the extraordinary ability of Indians to speak eloquently on subjects 
on which they know absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Professor said, if, if, I, if I can turn to uh, yeah. the pop populism part of our, uh, of our discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, the, the uh, populism part of our discussion. Yeah. Uh, you know, the term means different things to different people. It's, uh, you have right-wing populism, you have left-wing populism. There is a tendency to, for people to compare certain kinds of leaders. For example, often, often Modi and Trump are clubbed together. As, as representing the same kind of, of uh, social f of political phenomenon. Uh, how do you, um, in, in, in your book, uh, or in your view, how do you see uh, the advent of, what explains the advent of populism broadly defined in uh, polity after polity? And, and to add to Siddharth. Yes. Indian case is very different from European or American case. So if I remember you correctly. So would you please elaborate on that? Yeah. Yeah, I said something slightly different from that, but I'll come to that if I may, uh, for a while. Yeah. But um, the, first the first thing to deal with uh, is the third question. You know, populism is a common phenomenon in the world. Uh, people form a view, and then, uh, then that view becomes widespread, and unless you resist it. And then you could spread it and use it. When the first millennium Christian was coming to an end, there was a complete scare over Europe that all of the world will be destroyed. And since that became so popular that people were worried about how to prevent their, prevent perishing in that catastrophe. There was a, no, there was quite a literature on that subject about the end, end of the world, 1000 AD. It wasn't common in and then nobody here thought partly because we didn't have the Christian calendar in quite that form. But uh, even though it, it was known in, in Kerala since Christians were there from 4th century AD, the, um, if some story goes wrong, it can generate uh, great relief. Uh, you know, I think the reason why uh, uh, we don't eat certain types of food. I believe even beef and pork van was uh, connected with somehow convincing yourself that uh, it will do you a lot of harm. Now, I know there's another story about the sacredness of cow and so on, but uh, that's a different kind of story. You know, when I was young, I was hitchhiking with a friend of mine called Rehman Truvan from what was then East Pakistan. And we would get lifts sometime in, in hitchhiking. And in Sweden, we got lift together from someone who decided to give us a meal. And he said that, tell me, I'm so interested that, um, is it right that some of you from South Asia don't eat beef, and some of you don't eat pork. Is that right that one of you don't eat beef, one of you don't eat pork? Then the man said, well, the master has no taste, so he, he eats everything. But actually, a proper Hindu does not eat beef. And as a proper Muslim, and he wasn't a proper Muslim, he was pretending. He said, <laughs> he said I don't eat pork. And then he said, however, this was a point of great importance to Rehman, there's a difference. Hindus don't eat beef because they regard the animal called cow to be holy. Muslims don't eat pork because we regard pigs to be dirty. There is a big difference between the two. 
Now that befuddled the mind of the Swede even more. <laughs> and as we were going out, he gave us a little lift to the train station. And he said, we must continue the discussion. And he looked at everyone and he said, you must sometime explain to me why is it that Muslims regard pigs to be holy? <laughs> <laughs> I told Rehman that you better learn economics well <laughs> because you're not going to get a job as an anthropology teacher. <laughs> Absolutely clear. <laughs> but um, these are popular beliefs, really, and then Fred, you know, uh, and I know that I would be dragged over coal, burning coal for having questioned the holiness of the cow. And indeed, a film on me was, in fact, banned for a period, among other things, for the holiness of cow coming under a certain amount of questioning dispute. Uh, though eventually, the censor board let that off, but did not let me off good lot. I could not say anything negative about 2002 uh, in, in good lot. I think. Uh, populism is the most common thing that happens to, to, to people. And I mentioned religion and holiness, but it's politics too. After all, fascism. Uh, Nazism, these are popular beliefs way before this. And people even sometimes don't even know why they have this belief. One of my favorite stories from the time of spread of fascism in Italy is about a fascist recruiter who goes to a, this is 1923, they're trying to recruit uh, uh, non-fascists into fascists. And the fascist recruiter goes into a village and explains why fascism is far superior. You see, Mussolini has taken over, and the trains are running on time. Malaria has been eradicated from the Eastern District. You must join the fascist party. And the, this person says, listen, I can't join the fascist party, because you see, my father was a socialist. My grandfather was a socialist. I could not possibly join the fascist party, and this fascist said, what kind of a silly argument is this? Just because your father was a fascist socialist and grandfather was a socialist, doesn't stop you from being whatever you want. What would you have done if, for example, your father was a murderer and <laughs> grandfather was a murderer? What would you have done then? To which this simple villager says, well, in that case, of course, I would have joined the fascist party. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there are a lot of beliefs that we have which are very much in our mind, and given a suitable opportunity, it may come out. So I don't think there's something very special about Trump and Modi today. Uh, and... Uh, nor about um, uh, all these, uh, uh, you know, even this poor and hungry thing that's happening. The question is how to encounter it. Yeah. And, and that, that's where our problem lies. And uh, I have to say that uh, the uh, uh, Comparing Europe with uh, I mean, uh, Modi and the Hindu, it, it raises a very different issue, particularly because of connection with religion. But the, if you compare Europe with, with America, I would say at this time uh, there is more going on in America to resist right. Trumpism than there is going on in Europe to uh, this Islamophobia or, or anti-immigrant things, yeah. Right. Uh, and, and that's, it's important. You know, sometimes 
uh, I'm critical of America. I wasn't critical today, by the way. You recognize this would have been illegal in America in the sense that because of the disability law, you cannot have an access which a disabled person as I am now uh, would not be able to negotiate. You, I could take you to court <laughs> <laughs> for that. But there's no corresponding thing. In Mac, I remember taking a flight from uh, from um, uh, from uh, New York to uh, to um, I, th I think it was I can't think I think it was Hamburg, and trying to get in the get in the airport, and there's nothing other than steps to climb up. I would have straight away sued it had it been the United States. So I think there's a lot of fighting going on. And right now, I think there's a lot to learn from what's going on in, there's a lot to learn from Europe, but there's a lot to learn from what's going on in Iraq. There's a lot to learn from each other right now at this time. And the, and the specificity of what Apurva was saying about India, because uh, here, what marks the BJP out, or what marks this kind of so-called populism or uh, communalism or fascism, whatever you want to call it, is the presence of an organization like the RSS, which is quite unique in many ways. I don't know how unique RSS is, <laughs> because there are a whole lot of um, uh, photo, I shouldn't uh, make sinful comparison, uh, similar beliefs, and you know, to compare them with fascists would be, uh, would be too strong. But certainly, a uh, strong belief of that kind of kind, which you are not ready to question, is known in Europe, uh, certainly known in America. Uh, the anti-anarchist movement in America would be something. But you know, a, a lot of, lot of uh, uh, the, um, uh, rules we follow are based on such belief. I mean, for example, I'm, every time I go to, say, Germany, it is quite a problem for me to stand at a red light when there's no traffic in any direction and not cross the street. It seems to me that anything I've learned in India is denied <laughs> by that degree of hesitation. One occasion I remember, I was trying to, I think, uh, I think it was Hanover, I was trying, I stood there. After a little while, I said, look, this is damn silly. There's no car anywhere at all. So I crossed it, and there was a chap on the other side. And he looked at me, and I thought I was very famous, because he said, <laughs> because he said, Professor Sen, you, don't cross the, uh, cross the street when it's red. So I was very pleased that he recognized me. So I said, uh, I thought I would be condescending to him. We seem to deserve. So I said, well, where did we meet last, I asked him. <laughs> and he said, no, we have never met. You are wearing your conference badge. <laughs> 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 but the, but the, uh, but the habit of not crossing is something you cannot cultivate it. If if you have not done it, I mean, I, when I went to China, I want to say whether the Chinese are like India, and I think they're more in the sense that they would run when they say a motorcycle is coming <laughs> before it gets there. So I don't think they 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 any discipline that the Chinese have, and they do have more discipline than Indian, is not arising from there, wherever it may be arising from. Now, coming back to this, I think the, the real thing is not the RSS. I think we have integrated our populism with our general divisionism of which caste and tribe are a part, so that quite often, 
we are not even concerned whether we are carrying the entire people with us. For example, cows have been eaten by uh, non-caste Hindus yes. for a long time, and not many people worry it, except when it becomes an issue like today, whereby you treat it as a way of penalizing the lower caste for eating beef, for doing skin trade, and so on. So the Indian combination of um, the, uh, the animosity that goes with division in, in, in terms of caste and tribe has given the um, populism a further shape that European populism standardly does not have. That's what has for me. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.